Let's take the Word of God this evening and to turn to 1 Peter and to chapter number 3. 1 Peter, chapter number 3. Uh, that's where we'll be uh, starting. Uh, we began uh, last week a new series entitled Armed with the Mind of Christ. Uh, out of 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1, uh, where the Apostle Peter says, For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the, fl in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. Uh, it sounds like a command, doesn't it? Arm yourselves likewise with the mind of Christ. And so we began last week talking about uh, the mind of Christ, and we're really laying down some, uh, if you would, some foundational truths uh, concerning the mind. And last week we talked about understanding uh, the mind. Uh, we have a created mind. Uh, our mind is also responsive. And uh, we uh, came to understand a few truths about the mind this evening. In uh, 1 Peter chapter number 3, we're going to begin reading in verse 15. And I want to speak this evening at something that is related to the mind. And I believe it's very important as I was seeking uh, direction there. Uh, we cannot escape the subject of the conscience if we're going to deal with the mind. Uh, what is the conscience? Uh, what is it? Uh, and we're going to deal with that tonight. 1 Peter chapter 3, notice verse number 15. The Word of God says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Notice, having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil, uh, evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good, your good conversation in Christ. For it is better if the will of God be so, that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. For Christ also hath one suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. By which also he went and preached unto the spirits of in prison, which sometimes were disobedient, when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a-preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being subject unto Him. And then we go into chapter 4, verse 1. For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. So we're speaking here on being armed with the mind of Christ. We come here to uh, really two verses that are, uh, that are repeating here. Verse 16 says, having a good conscience. And then in verse 21, the Bible speaks, notice, a good conscience toward God. So this evening I want to preach a message entitled this, a good conscience toward God. When we deal with the mind, and as we dealt with last week with the mind, how we all the thoughts that we have, and we saw that the mind was created, but also the mind is corrupt. That's why the Bible says uh, uh, that the heart of man is desperately wicked above all things. Who can know it? Now the Bible deals with the heart and the mind, and many times these are used interchangeably. The Bible talks about the thoughts of our hearts, and so those are connected. But I want us to also deal with the with the uh, the uh, the truth concerning the conscience. Uh, because the Bible deals a lot with the subject of the conscience, and it is an important subject. And so as we approach being armed with the mind of Christ, uh, we have to approach this with this in mind, that God has created us uh, special, we're different as we saw last week than animals, and that, that we have a conscience. Uh, before we begin, the conscience is a gift from God. It is. He created us with a conscience. And it is something that is to be used for our benefit. And we're going to talk about that this evening. So first of all, as we consider a good conscience toward God, uh, we see first of all the possession of a conscience. The possession of a conscience. Now in the passage we just read, the Bible ta is talking about a good 
conscience. A good conscience that's towards God. We also see the Apostle Paul speaks of a good conscience towards God and towards men. Uh, so as we deal with the subject of a conscience, we see that every single person that is alive today possesses a conscience. Now let's go to Romans chapter 2, unless you think that that's just for those that are believers, that's not so. Romans chapter number 2. I want you to turn there with me if you would please. And look here as the Apostle Paul is writing to the church at Rome. Uh, he mentions here uh, two verses, speaking of the Gentiles and those that have rebelled against God, have chosen to, although they knew God, not to recognize Him as God. He continues in chapter 2 and verse 14. He says, For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves. Romans 2, notice verse 15. Which show the work of the law written in their hearts. Notice their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts, the meanwhile accusing or out excusing one another. Notice the Bible talks about the law of God is written in the heart of every man, and the Bible says, the, uh, notice, uh, their conscience also bearing witness. We have to come to the understanding that every single person has a conscience. And within this conscience is found the knowledge of the law of God. In chapter 1 of the book of Romans, he says that creation declares the fact that there is a God. But also he declares in chapter 2 the fact that we have a conscience. A man that we have a conscience declares that there is a God. That's why when we witness to people, we give them the law. I just was talking to Alex when I talked to him on Saturday. I said, Alex, the fact is when you're, uh, as you grew up and as you have uh, children later on, and as I have children, the fact is you don't teach children how to do the wrong things. They do those things automatically. But guess what? When they lie, they know they're lying, and they know it's wrong. Why? Because they have a conscience. Conscience is a gift from God. Now, before we think that conscience is always good, uh, do you ever heard of the, you know, follow your conscience? Don't follow your conscience. That's not what the conscience is there for. We'll come to an understanding of that. But we see that every child, young person and adult, has a conscience. A conscience, the, our conscience is a gift from God. We see, first of all, as we think about the possession of a conscience, we see, first of all, its purpose. What's the purpose of a conscience? Well, let's go to Acts chapter number 24. Just a few pages there to your left. Uh, Acts comes before Romans. Acts 24. Uh, notice uh, verse number, uh, read a few verses, verse number 14. The Bible says this, But this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing in all things which are written in the law and in the prophets, and have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust, and unjust. And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience, notice, void of offense toward God, and toward men. Now the Apostle Paul says, this is what I exercise for. This is what I'm working for, to always have a conscience that is void of offense toward God and toward men. Think about it this way. The conscience has access to every single one of our thoughts. The conscience knows every single one of our thoughts. The conscience is, if you would, is what cries out against sin. That's the conscience. In other words, the law of God is written in our hearts, and what do they do? They accuse or excuse. Why? Uh, with their conscience. The conscience is what cries out and says, that is sin. That is wrong. Stop. That's what the conscience is. One, somebody put it this way. He said, the conscience is like a police officer. That condemns. You remember in John chapter 1 verse 8, or chapter 8 verse 1 through 9, as uh, the religious people bring a woman that was caught in the act of adultery uh, to Jesus Christ, and they say, well, this is what the law says, and what do you say? And Jesus Christ basically told them, He said, well, uh, he, he, you that is without sin, let him cast the first stone. And the Bible says in verse 9, and they which heard it being convicted by their own conscience went out one by one beginning at the eldest even unto the last and Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst so the conscience was there convicting them and saying you're a sinner 
You've broken the law. You are a transgressor of the law. You bring this woman over here saying that she's transgressed the law, but the conscience was there to say, you are in sin. Their own conscience. You see, the conscience is to the mind what pain is to the body. Physical pain says something needs to be taken care of. I was thinking about Nick. He just hurt his finger. Now he comes in with a little bruise on his cheek. Uh, you know what? When he experiences pain, you know what that pain, the pain says? The pain says you need to take care of it. You need to fix it. You need to put a Band-Aid on it. You need to readjust if a bone is broken. Put it back into place. That's what pain says to the body. The conscience says something needs to be taken care of. And it does that in the mind. The conscience gives us enough knowledge we understand to condemn us, but not enough knowledge to redeem us. Again, the conscience is a gift from God, and its purpose, if you would, is to be there as an arbiter, as we know the law of God is written in our hearts and says, you are transgressing. You are going against the truth, the principles, the precepts, the commandments of the Word of God. That's what the conscience is there for. So we see its purpose, but number two, we see its power. Now I'll just touch on that, we'll come back to that in just a moment, but in Romans chapter 9, if you'd please turn there, the Apostle Paul is going to make a remarkable statement. Perhaps out of all the statements of the Word of God, it is to me, from a man, the most perplexing statement. He says this in Romans chapter 9, verse 1, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. Now notice Paul says this, before he's about to make this statement, he says, my conscience also bearing witness in the Holy Ghost. What's his statement? Verse 2, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. The Apostle Paul says this, If it meant the salvation of my brethren, I would go to hell. Now he says that after he just said, My conscience also bearing me witness. In other words, God knows. And I know that I speak the truth. My conscience is there to bear witness that I'm not lying. You see, the conscience is a powerful thing, isn't it? We're going to see that in just a moment. So we see that every single person possesses a conscience. We see the possession of a conscience, its purpose, and its power. But number two, we see the potential of our conscience. Now it comes in the idea today, and I've heard that even sometimes uh, preachers say that, you know, you're supposed to follow your conscience. Actually, no. <laughs> because... The, potential, the conscience has a potential for good, but it also has a potential for bad. You say, well, what do you mean by that? Well, as we think about the potential of our conscience, we see, first of all, it, the conscience, can be perverted and hardened. Let's go to Titus chapter 1, if you would please. Titus chapter number 1. We're going to flip here, go through different verses, because I want us to see at the potential of the conscience uh, for bad. <clears throat> Let me stop and say this. God created man, and it's wonderful. The man, man's body is wonderful, but it can be corrupted, can it? The mind, as we looked at last week, the mind is a wonderful thing. Uh, uh, most people have over 10,000 thoughts every day. Uh, there's more knowledge in every person's mind than there is in the National Library in Washington. And you think about all those things. It is a great thing, but it can be corrupted. And so does the conscience has the potential to be corrupted. Now, notice in Titus chapter 1, verse 15, the, the Bible says here, Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even, notice, their mind and their conscience is defiled. So we understand that God has given every man a conscience, but we have to come to the understanding today that yes, the law of God is written in our hearts, the, 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 our conscience bears witness, but that conscience that is bearing witness can be defiled. That conscience can be corrupted. 
Uh, that conscience can become something it was not in, intended for it to become. Just like our minds are created for to do wonderful things, but it can be corrupted. Just like our bodies are created to do wonderful things, but it can be corrupted to do things that are evil in the sight of God. Again, this verse speaks concerning the mind and the conscience can be defiled. Do not let your conscience be your guide, because the conscience can be defiled, perverted, and hardened. Sometimes you hear people say, well, I do not feel convicted about this truth in the Bible. The reason for that is because your conscience has been seared. Because your conscience has been defiled. You know, sometimes, in a, I, I, I hear that quite a bit, and I mean, not since I've been here, but I've heard this in the past of uh, people say, well, you know what, I, I see it, I just, I'm just not convicted by it, just God doesn't speak to my heart. Have you ever thought that perhaps your conscience is defiled? That perhaps before uh, there was kind of this witness that was saying, this is the right thing, walk ye in it, and you chose not to walk, and now you're not convicted by it anymore? Have you ever thought that perhaps the case is that your conscience has been defiled? Your conscience has been hardened to the things of God. And that we see can happen in the Word of God. In Romans chapter 2, verse 15, well, it's, uh, the, Jesus, uh, the Apostle Paul says, The work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness in their thoughts, the meanwhile uh, accusing or out excusing one another. I want us to go back to Romans chapter 1 because I want us to look at this passage <clears throat> and we see a progression here in Romans chapter number 1. Notice in verse 18, Romans chapter 1 verse 18. The Bible says here, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Notice, men who hold the truth, that means they have it. But they hold the truth in unrighteousness. Verse 19. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Being, notice, understood by the things that are made. Even His eternal power and Godhead. So that they are without excuse. Verse 21. Because that when they knew God. And they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen." For this cause God gave them up unto vile affection, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Verse 28, And even as they did not like to retain God, notice, in their knowledge, God gave them over to a what? To a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Verse 31, Without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable and merciful, who notice, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. You see, the knowledge that they have in their mind, they chose to rebel against their, that knowledge, they hardened their hearts, and in chapter 2, in verse 5, he says, But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasure up unto thyself wrath against the, the day of wrath, uh, and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. And then he goes on in verse 14 of chapter 2. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or out excusing one another. So we see here that man is speaking of the world and those that, those that have rejected God have the knowledge of God in creation. They have the knowledge of God in their conscience, but they've hardened their hearts. They changed the truth that they knew into a lie. And they worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And therefore he says, look, they, they even have a conscience. They've hardened themselves against the creation and the conscience that God has given them. And therefore God had to give them over. What happens? What happens? 
Well, according to 1 Timothy chapter 4, the Bible describes the Apostle Paul to Timothy this time, describes this, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. The word seared means to render insensitive. The imaginary would, 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 when be, would be when the skin is burned with a hot iron, it is void of feeling. Just like in old times when they used to steer the cows, uh, they would, right, uh, uh, make it sure that it was uh, as, as hot as could be, and then they would sear it with a hot iron. They would mark the cows. And you know what happened? That would be painful, but from that moment on, that cow would have no feeling in that area that was burned. That's exactly what happens to the conscience. The conscience itself can be seared with a hot iron. The conscience that is there to bear witness of the law written in their hearts, the conscience that's supposed to be void of offense, as Paul the Apostle Paul wrote, the conscience can also be something that becomes so hard, uh, so defiled, and so hardened that it is not used for the purpose that God intended it to be used for. You know, when we silence our conscience, we have done more harm than we could ever imagine. If you want a picture of the world and think about the most vile things that ever take place, you say, how could that be possible? Because of a seared conscience. They become so hardened to the things of God and to the truth. Think about it this way. It's not that they don't want to have anything to do with the truth. They actually fight against the truth. Why? Because it's become so hard. And now there's a hatred for something that they forsook. They left behind something that they knew was the truth. So it's not just about denying the truth now. It's about attacking the truth itself. Why? Because they become so hardened to the things that they knew were true. You see, the potential of the conscience is that it can be perverted and harden. That's why I don't say, well, follow your conscience, because then people say, well, I just don't feel convicted about that. That's not, your conscience is guided by the Word of God. Remember what the Apostle Paul wrote, my, my conscience in the Holy Ghost. You see, the Holy Ghost is the He that guides us into all truth. Where is the truth found? It's found in the Word of God. You see, this is the, the manual for our lives, if you would, and the conscience is there to guide us. And if we become, say, well, I'm not convicted about this, and I just don't think I should follow this because I just feel a convicted, you ought to think, perhaps, that your conscience has been defiled. But God can soften that and bring it back to a place where it can be used for good. To have a good conscience toward God and toward men. So we see the potential of our conscience. It can be perverted and hardened, but number two, it can be pure and holy. Let's go to 1 Timothy, if you would. 1 Timothy chapter 1. The Apostle Paul again writes to Timothy, and he had mentioned to Timothy that those that are False teachers that follow after their own perverse ways have their conscience seared with a hot iron, but he keeps, he writes to Timothy and encourages them to have a good conscience, a holy, a pure conscience. 1 Timothy 1.5 He says, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother uh, uh, Eunice, I am persuaded that in thee also, actually, I mean, that's 2 Timothy. Did I say 1 Timothy or 2 I said first. I was reading second. All right. I got to go back to first now. Verse number five. Notice. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of, a, notice, pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. He speaks to Timothy, notice, about a good conscience. If you go to chapter 3 and verse 9, he refers to the conscience again. He says, the, he says this to Timothy, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, in his second letter to Timothy in verse 3, he says, I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. Notice he talks about uh, with a pure conscience. So we see in the Word of God that it is possible for the conscience to be hardened, to be defiled, uh, to be seared, to become so hardened. Hardened. 
but also we see the opposite end of the spectrum, if you would, where the conscience can be pure. That's why it is not the conscience that's our guide, it's the Word of God that's our guide. You see, we even have to examine our own conscience, whether it is defiled or whether it is pure. You see, as we think about being armed with the mind of Christ and having the victory in our mind, we have to bring in the conscience factor, and the conscience is there to be a help to us, but we have to make sure that the conscience is pure. Now, within the conscience, we could speak of many things, but we see as we continue in the subject here, not only the possession of a conscience, the potential of our conscience, but thirdly, the peace of a pure conscience. In Romans chapter 13, and verse 1 through 5, the Apostle Paul says, Let every soul be subject to the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God, whosoever there, therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation, for rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same, for he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is a minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. Do you see what he says here? The Apostle Paul says, look, you need to be subject to the higher powers because they're ordained of God. Uh, God is in control of those things, and therefore you need to uh, fear the higher power. Now, this is something I'm instructed you to do, and this is a commandment for you as a believer. He says, wherefore, we must needs be subject not only for wrath. In other words, don't just do what I tell you to do because you're afraid of the wrath of God. Do what I tell you to do also for conscience' sake. Do you want to learn to live with yourself? Do you want to go home at night and lay your head on the pillow at night and have a conscience that is void of offense, a conscience that is clear before God and before men? So there's nothing in your life as between you and God. Because you see, we, we, we live in our lives as in front of people and people don't know, but the fact is we have to live with the own things that motivate our own soul, the things that motivate us, even the, the, the things that maybe we could do the right things, but we do it for the wrong reason. The conscience is there to bear witness. Can we live with our conscience? Hebrews chapter 13, verse 18, Pray for us, he says, for we trust we have a good conscience in all things willing to live honestly. You see, that was a prayer request. He says, pray for us. For we trust, why? Because we have a desire to have a a good conscience. We want to be at peace. In 1 Peter 3, verse 15, the passage which began, the Apostle Peter says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give... an answer to everyone, every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is with, uh, within you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience. But notice here where he says, that whereas they speak of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. You see what he says in the context? You're going through persecution, and there's people that might falsely accuse you. In that particular passage, he says, look, it is better for you to suffer because you're doing good than to suffer because you're doing something evil. So he's basically saying say, say here, look, uh, you're suffering for the right reason, but guess what? You still have a good conscience. Isn't that better worth in your life to have a good conscience before God and before men knowing that you've done right, that you can live with yourself? And not have the conscience that's there accusing and saying, what are you doing? You, you ought to know better. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12, For our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience. That in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our conversation in the world and more abundantly to us. Do you see here the context in which he uses this word? He says, for our rejoicing is this. This is what causes us to rejoice. Notice, do we want to rejoice tonight? The testimony of our conscience. This is how we can rejoice. 
because of the testimony of our conscience. You see, we can go back and, and when we go through our busyness of life as we uh, going back and forth from work, going back and forth to church, uh, family members and all the activities and the events that we go to, he says, but our rejoicing in the, is this, the testimony of our conscience. The conscience that follows us everywhere we go. The conscience that's there all the time, that pure conscience that we're talking about, the testimony of our conscience. Notice that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have our conversation in the world and more abundantly to us were. You see, he talks about this honestly, sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but the grace of God. You see, why is the world miserable? You think about looking at all those faces and the broken families and the broken heart and the people whose lives have been destroyed. Doesn't it occur to you that sometimes you look at these people and there's like a blankness there? There's no joy, no happiness. And they live in sin and they know they're living in sin and they want to stay there. And you say, it doesn't feel right. Why? Why? Because of their conscience. The testimony of their conscience. You see, we're dealing with the subject of the mind. But the conscience is really there as a God really equips us, if you would, with that conscience. To help us to get to the place where when nobody else is there. When nobody else sees when nobody else knows, God gives us a witness. Someone to testify of our lives that nobody else knows. And that's the conscience. The conscience is there when we're by ourselves in the quietness and nothing is going on. The conscience is there to bring forth a testimony and say, did you do things out of sincerity? Or was it the wisdom of the world? You see, the conscience is there as a testimony. You know, think so many times in our lives we, I'm sure, go through things and uh, we have to be sensitive. And I know we, the Holy Spirit of God is there. He guides us. He convicts us. I understand that. But you know, there's another tool that God has that he's equipped all of us is, and that is with our conscience. We not only have the Holy Spirit that convicts us, but we also have a conscience that's there. When perhaps, perhaps, when we've kind of shunned the Holy Spirit of God, when we kind of say, well, I don't want to live uh, yielded to the Spirit of God, I want to live my own life, there's another layer, if you would, where God use, has the conscience and there to bring forth a witness. And I think all throughout my life, you can see points, no doubt the Holy Spirit works, but where the conscience says, what are you doing? What are you doing? Why are you wasting your time? Why are you doing this? Is that, is that really important? Conscience bearing witness. Where you do things, you do something for the praise of men. And the conscience says, is that sincere? Is that sincere? Is that righteous? Is that holy? Do you have a a good conscience toward God and toward men. Because we can't hide anything from God. We might could, have, could hide things from men, but the Apostle Paul makes sure to clear. He says, look, my conscience is void of offense toward God and toward men. You see, even though someone may accuse me of something that I've done that's not true, my conscience bears witness. My conscience knows. You see, that's an encouraging thing, isn't it? Perhaps when you're falling, can you imagine Joseph? When he lived his entire life, a holy life, a righteous life, even in the moment where nobody would have caught him, he could have hid his sin, he chose to run away from this woman that wanted to commit adultery with him. And guess what? And you say, well, wow, that, that was a bold decision. And uh, perhaps this woman, as you think about the behavior that she wanted to do, uh, she did that thing, but guess what? Then she lied about it. But then she had to live with herself saying that I am the one who did that, and then I am the one who lied about it, and I am the one who caused this man who was innocent to go to jail. She has to live with her conscience. 
But Joseph on the other side, who's been falsely accused, guess what? That night, he can lay his head on the pillow at night saying, I have, my conscience is clear. The testimony of my conscience is that I'm void of offense. I have done nothing wrong. So let me ask you this this evening. Is your conscience bearing witness? Are you void of offense toward God and toward men? The conscience is bearing witness. And when it comes to the mind, the battleground that no one can see, God equips us with a conscience to help us in our mind, in our thinking, and says, am I thinking, as I mentioned last week, if people could look at our minds as what's going on within, within, within our minds, would people be drawn to Christ or would people be drawn to the world? We have to answer that. And may the Lord help us. A good conscience toward God.